Chapter Thirty Seven. Statism as a Religious Fact. Three. The modern state is in continuity with Plato's Republic and Aristotle's Politics. In Plato's Republic, there are no laws, only philosopher kings whose sovereign planning constitutes the source of all law. It is necessary, in the perspective of Hellenic thought, for elite men to rule, because quote, chance and accidents legislate everything for us, and it is necessary to assert the reign of reason. In Plato's perspective. Quote unquote, God is on the level of chance and accidents as the blind unreason of being. Quote unquote, guardians are needed to control men in society. Justice does not come from God, but from reason. God does not reveal a law. Virtue itself is rational order. It is this perspective which subverted the medieval era and the modern world. Since law does not come from God, neither does sovereignty and government. Given the growing medieval respect for Greek thought, the natural order was seen as the determinative order, and the great natural order is the state. The government and predestination of man was transferred from God to man. In England, King Henry the Second, in the Constitutions of Clarendon, asserted his "quote unquote" rights over the Church. The Constitutions, eleven sixty four, extended the already existing civil power over the Church even further. Against this, Thomas Becket asserted the freedom of the Church. For him, the basic issues were: first, the inviolability of Church property; second, canonical elections to high offices in the Church. That is, with minimal royal interference. Third, freedom for churchmen to leave the country at will, to obey a summons from the Pope, to consult the Pope, or carry appeals to him. Fourth, freedom to fill vacancies promptly. Fifth, control of church property and church jurisdiction by the bishops. Sixth, free entry of papal legates into the country. Seventh, recognition by the King of papal authority over the whole church in England. And eighth, freedom from interference and control by the barons. Two years later, in 1166, Henry II issued the Assizes of Clarendon, which contained the first civil legislation on heresy since Rome's era. It was the state which demanded uniformity and subservience, both of the church and all individuals. Winston noted, quote. The very language of the assize testified to the general state of lawlessness, and to a tendency to institute tyrannical rule. End quote. The state then, as now, is more interested in power and control than in peace and freedom. The state, however, had in its favour the growing humanism of society, which the revival of Greek and Roman thought greatly furthered. The Renaissance was the culmination of the decline of late medieval thought and life. Petrarch summed up the new outlook with a motto he adopted from Terence: quote, "I am a man, and nothing human do I consider alien to myself." End quote. Humane letters now replace theology as the true basis of knowledge and history. Classical history was quote. Put forward as an instrument for the renovation or salvation of society, end quote. It was the revival of classicism which led Erasmus in February 1517 to write about his expectations soon of a golden age. Ever since, the dream of a golden age by human planning has become more and more prominent in Western thought. State projects are seen as major steps towards a humanistic utopia. Slum clearance in recent years has been seen as salvation. In terms of this faith, Robert Weaver, former administrator of the U.S. Housing and Home Finance Agency, once said that, with slum clearance and the work of social agencies, quote, miracles can be accomplished. End quote. In the lives of families, Peter Morris, an English quote social scientist, end quote, observed, quote. In Robert Weaver's words, what is to be accomplished is not the recreation of a way of life, 
without rats, dirt, and overcrowding, but a miracle, a shock of enlightenment which, like a religious conversion, transforms a person overnight. End quote. Change is to occur by quote unquote revolution, state conducted or otherwise, according to humanism. Franz Fanon appealed to violence as society's hope. He saw violence as quote, an assertion of meaning rather than an act of destruction. End quote. What Fanon said plainly, legislators hold to implicitly, and social legislation in the modern era is increasingly designed to do violence to society. Lawmaking by the humanistic state is a form of warfare against man and society. As Owen Chadwick pointed out, quote, Society is impossible without law, end quote. When lawmaking passed into the hands of the state, secularization began. Quote, the Reformation made all secular life into a vocation of God. It was like a baptism of the secular world. End quote. However, because lawmaking became all the more a state function, the Reformation and the Counter Reformation were undermined. In the Enlightenment, the humanistic philosophies triumphed and humanistic secularization proceeded. While the Enlightenment affected the leaders of society, the humanistic secularization affected the many. This secularism meant a radically this worldly approach. Determination is by man within history, not by God. On November the 16th, 1878, the conservative deputy Comte de Mont, speaking to the Paris Chamber of Deputies, said, quote, The revolution puts the human reason as sovereign in place of the law of God. From this flows all the rest especially the pride and rebellion which is a source of the modern state. The state has taken over everything. The state has become your god. End quote. Such a state cannot tolerate anything with a will or a government of its own. This was stated plainly by a Republican anti-clerical in France in the 1880s. Quote, anything with a strong moral life has a will of its own. Anything with a will of its own embarrasses government, end quote. From the days of Tertullian to the present, the strong moral life of faithful Christians and churches has been no commendation of them to earnest statists. A strong moral unit of men creates a strong centre of strength and government apart from the state. There is thus a hostility to the moral element and an indulgence of the immoral for Hegel, the kings of yesterday, and for the bureaucracies of today, quote, the state's highest duty is to perpetuate itself, end quote. Because the state sees itself as the overlord for all within the territory of the state, it grows increasingly intolerant of any divergent element, especially one which insists on a transcendental order. The true Christian must insist on the crown rights of Christ the King. He believes in God's law. He recognises the necessity of obeying and pleasing God, not man. And he moves in terms of his calling from God. He has what the modern state detests, a dual citizenship in the local state and in the kingdom of God. In that dual citizenship, God's kingdom has priority and must govern over the local realm. There is thus a state of war between modern civil orders and Christ's kingdom. Those who refuse to recognize that war will become the first victims of it.